All right, I want to start first by talking about our bariatric program here. So um, you should know that at the University of Missouri, we have a, a bariatric program which is considered and ha has been designated a center of excellence by uh, our society. Uh, we have three designated center of excellence surgeons as well. Uh, we perform close to 400 or a little over 400 bariatric procedures a year at Mizzou uh, and over my uh, time of, of uh, serving as a bariatric surgeon I've probably performed close to 6,000 of these procedures. Um, so going back to 1986, you know, when you turn on the news, whether you watch CNN or Fox, regardless of which way you lean, the news on obesity is always the same. It's a problem that's been growing and is getting worse, and, and what can we do to stop it? And so these slides uh, will just sort of show you how obesity has increased from uh, the mid-1980s to the turn of the century. And you see that what is was considered overweight approximately 30 pounds over ideal body weight in 1986 and the percentages uh, as you go from light blue to dark blue and then you see that with time we're getting more and more of the dark blue now a darker blue and then somewhere uh, close to the mid to late 1990s we now add a red and uh, again whether you want to be a, a red state or a blue state really doesn't matter you, you don't want to be either uh, in terms of obesity. Now we have even a new category with certain states being exceedingly overweight with time. The significance to that is that with that obesity comes a series of comorbidities. Uh, and this talk was to center and is to center on diabetes. But as you can see, with the greater BMI, the prevalence of diabetes goes up. Of course, there are many other comorbidities that go along with obesity. Uh, you can see asthma, d depression, high blood pressure being a significant one. And one that I did not know of until I was well into my bariatric career. If you are morbidly obese, your chance of dying from cancer goes way up. And by the way, this is a, uh, across the board. Women have higher incidence of breast cancer, ovarian cancer, uterine cancer. Men have a higher incidence of pancreatic cancer, prostate cancer, and so forth. So being obese increases your likelihood of death from uh, uh, cancer. Okay, well this slide didn't show up. Okay, so what we're talking about is uh, morbid obesity, and with morbid obesity there's an increase in free fatty acids. And what that leads to is uh, an increase in insulin resistance at the muscle, so there's less glucose uptake, Again, insulin resistance and more glucose release from the liver. Your insulin production from the pancreas goes up. And in terms of your vascularity, there is more constriction and less relaxation of the vessels across the body. Metabolic syndrome, with that insulin resistance, uh, you see more than just diabetes. Now to make the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome, you look for uh, three of the five things that I have listed there. Not just the high sugars, but also central uh, obesity, central fat, increase in triglycerides, increase in blood pressure, and then you can have uh, coagulation issues uh, and, and endothelial dysfunction and other things that are, can be associated in order to make the diagnosis of metabolic syndrome and the resulting atherosclerosis. All right? So the question that I was asked is, okay, you're going to talk about surgery versus non-surgery, versus exercise in this case. And this was something that was looked at by the National Institutes of Health as far back as 1991. And in 1991, they came out with their consensus statement, which they have since reaffirmed numerous times. And that is that if you're going to treat the problem of morbid obesity, surgery is the only way to obtain permanent consistent weight loss in a morbidly obese patient. And you look at the slide and, and you're just looking at, um, in the solid line, you're looking at patients who started at a much higher BMI, had surgery, and you see the rapid weight loss that, that uh, follows that, and you see how it tends to stay off more so than non-surgery, which there's more weight regain, even though they started at a much lower BMI. 
So the conclusion statements read by, uh, reached by the NIH are significant. Success in most cases of non-surgical therapy is only temporary. Okay, and by the way, it's uh, an organic genetically based disease. A lot of us tend to look at the morbidly obese and tend to point fingers and think, well, they just need to diet more and push the plate away more and aren't they just eating candy bars all the time? Well, there's a lot of uh, issues that go into what makes someone morbidly obese, uh, which is beyond the scope of our discussion here. Uh, mortality rates are 10 times greater for someone who's morbidly obese than someone else who's not uh, morbidly obese in the population. All right, so I won't read all of those. Um, uh, the operations for morbid obesity are not new. If you look here, surgery's been done for morbid obesity dating back to the mid-1950s. And uh, Mason uh, in Iowa in the late 60s was one of the first to do what's considered a hybrid procedure, taking a malabsorptive procedure and combining it with a restrictive procedure. And so uh, at the University of Minnesota, Henry Buckwald sort of did an evolution of surgery and the various procedures that have been done throughout the, uh, from the mid-50s on. Um, and for those of you here from Mizzou, you should take pride in several things relating to bariatric surgery. One, I see that Dr. Boyd Terry has come in, uh, who had a, a very uh, prominent career in bariatric surgery and continues to help in that regard. But also, if you look at the mid-1990s, actually 1992, uh, 1992 was the first time there was a publication on uh, the laparoscopic approach to a Roux-en-Y divided gastric bypass. And so Whitgrove and Clark are considered the fathers of gastric bypass done laparoscopically. Uh, Alan Whitgrove was a medical student here at the University of Missouri. As you go up the evolutionary tree, you see Dr. Stephen Scott, uh, who was my partner for many years. Dr. Scott was a medical student here uh, as well as did his undergraduate work here at the University of Missouri. And of course, I am currently on staff uh, and serve as the chief of general surgery uh, here at the university. And um, Dr. Scott and I published in the mid, uh, mid to late 1990s a new approach for doing a Roux and Y divided gastric bypass which is uh, one of the reasons we may be known by some uh, folks who do bari in bariatric circles. And uh, this approach was new in that the only known way was Whitgrove uh, and Clark's way, which involved passing a sharp device down the throat in order to position that device into the stomach and finish the operation. And Dr. Scott and I came up with what was then called the totally intra-abdominal approach and is now known as the transgastric method. There really are about four or five very well accepted methods for doing a Roux and Y divided gastric bypass laparoscopically, but as recently as last year, ASMBS still considered this the most popular. So in the normal anatomy, you see that the GE junction lies under the left lobe of the liver. It's so significant to us, we have to lift that in order to get to the area where we're going to do our surgery. But then from the stomach, you go to duodenum, jejunum, and then you follow small bowel down to ilium and keep that, that uh, orientation. However, after we perform our surgery, we divide the stomach, changing that organ from something that is normally the size of a football. And it's a football size in all of us. It's uh, amazing that if I operate on a 500-pound patient or operate on a 200-pound patient, uh, it's the same football size to the stomach. And we divide it, leaving this small pouch to come in contact with the food that that person eats. So now, instead of filling that uh, football-sized stomach in order to put those fibers on stretch and feeling full, they only need to feel, uh, fill this egg-sized pouch. And they get the same stretch and the same sensation of fullness, but with much less volume. So that's the restrictive component. The malabsorptive component then comes from the fact that this small bowel was jejunum that used to be in continuity down here. We've divided it and brought it up so that food now has an outlet. So a couple of things, it's called a Roux and Y divided gastric bypass. As you can see, it has sort of the configuration of the letter Y. Two arms, a biliopancreatic arm 
and the rue uh, uh, arm that come together at this apex and then they have one common channel that goes towards the colon. So again, the rue and Y divided gastric bypass. The other thing is that the food that a patient eats after the surgery doesn't begin to see any digestive enzymes until it gets to, gets to that apex. So all the pancreatic enzymes are here and it's not until the food hits that point that there's bile and pancreatic juices and, and gastric secretions that come in contact with the food they've eaten. Um, in around 1995, Walter Pores came out with this tremendous landmark paper which was published in the Annals of Surgery. And it was the first time someone actually came out, uh, to my knowledge, and said, wh who would have thought it? You know, here we've been treating this problem of diabetes with all these different medications, and there's a surgery that seems to have shown some tremendous benefit. Um, and, and in fact, it is a benefit that we had seen for years. And it's a benefit that has more to do with weight loss. I think everybody in this room is uh, knowledgeable enough to know that if you take an obese type 2 diabetic and you put them on a diet and they lose weight, the treatment of their diabetes gets easier. They'll need less hypoglycemic medication. They'll need less insulin in order to treat that diabetes. But the effect that we see from a Ruin Y is something that we see right away. So if we do a Ruin, uh, a Ruin Y divided gastric bypass on a type 2 diabetic who's morbidly obese, the next day they may need half of their medication, half their oral hypoglycemic or half their insulin or none. And after they go home in two or three days, many times they're off their medicines. So it's an effect that happens long before there is uh, weight loss. And we'll talk about some of the reasons why that is felt to be. Now, Nicholas Christow in Canada at McGill uh, did a study uh, in 2004 uh, that talked about the uh, decrease in mortality and morbidity following uh, Ruin Y divided gastric bypass in his patients. Uh, his study was a two cohort study. There were over 6,000 patients that were involved, matched for age, gender, and length of follow-up, which was five years, and using the Quebec uh, insurance that uh, seems to be uh, sort of a nationalized type of insurance where they can use that to follow patients, see who's had previous surgery, who's had previous treatment for different diseases. They were able to do quite an, uh, an impressive study matching the two cohorts, and they followed the patients, as I said, for about five years. And what they realized, what they found was that there was an 89% reduction in death uh, after five years in the group that had surgery rather than the morbidly obese group who said, you know what, I'm, I'm not going to have surgery, I'll just take care of this with non-surgical means. The other thing they found was the effects on comorbidity. Again, cancer much reduced in the surgical group infectious complications, musculoskeletal and cardiovascular diseases, and for our purposes, the endocrinological uh, diseases much less in the surgical group than in the non-surgical group. Of course, diabetes among that. Only in one area, you see respiratory, mental, skin, urinary, and in blood, everything seems to favor surgery. Uh, digestive complications and digestive issues, of course, follow the surgery, and that's something that we see in our practice, too. Internal hernias, uh, perforated ulcers, again, this group had surgery, this group didn't, so the likelihood for digestive or post-surgical complications is higher in the surgical group. Uh, Sh Scott Shakura took a look at the costs, and again, I have a limited amount of time, so the numbers aren't important, but it, it, obviously the problem of obesity is something that affects us in the tens of billions of dollars. Sorry. And the American Obesity Association pretty much summed it up by saying that about 10% of, of our national medical costs uh, can be related to the impact of obesity annually. And so, um, again, I mentioned Scott Shakura, who took a look at the cost of the medications associated with comorbidities, and you can see that before the gastric bypass procedure, the total cost is much greater than after, afterwards. And again, if you just break it down into diabetes and hypertension, 
those patients that were taking diabetic medications, their cost much higher before surgery than the post-surgical group and for hypertension as well. The number of meds, again, as you would expect, much less after surgery than the number of meds that these patients had to take before surgery, both in diabetes and high blood pressure. Now, we're often told, well, surgery may seem like a great option, but it's an expensive option. But if you look at the numbers, it's actually an option that pays for itself in about 22 months. When you take the cost of the medicines that are uh, bought by the uh, insurer or the patient themselves to take care of the comorbidities associated with their obesity, and you save that from the res because of the results of the surgery, you can see that there's about uh, uh, the same amount of savings after 22 months as the cost that would have incurred uh, for the surgery initially. So the question that I, uh, we are asked is, okay, well, if we're given this, that there is a benefit in terms of comorbidities following surgery, why? And uh, can we duplicate it with non-surgical means? So David Cummings and his group looked at type 2 diabetes and said uh, type 2 diabetes is the obesity-related comorbidity most dramatically ameliorated by the surgery, the Roux and Y divided gastric bypass. He looked at five large studies examining 3,500 subjects who underwent the Roux and Y procedure, and diabetic patients enjoyed what he calls complete disease remission. Sometimes we use the word cure, uh, and we use the word cure because the patient is euglycemic off all medication. He's using uh, a, a safer terminology by saying complete disease remission at rates ranging from 80% to almost 100%. They also looked at a meta-analysis of 136 studies involving over 22,000 patients that reported that the Roux and Y uh, completely resolved diabetes in about 85% of cases. And that's pretty much the data that we give our patients, that there's about an 85% resolution or cure rate, if you want to use that term, for type 2 diabetes following a Roux and Y divided gastric bypass. Now, why does it happen? Well, a lot of studies have been done looking for the changes that occur because of the surgery. And what we find are that ghrelin, which is located in the upper part of the stomach, no longer is stimulated to the degree that it was following surgery. Another surgery that we do here at the University of Missouri is the sleeve gastrectomy or vertical sleeve gastrectomy in which the lateral aspect of the stomach along with the fundus is removed and that is considered the ghrelin center and by removing that of course we remove ghrelin production to a great degree from the patients. So obviously after this procedure we know there's a decrease in ghrelin since we see resolution of diabetes to a very high degree with the sleeve gastrectomy procedure is ghrelin the reason that diabetes seems to be uh, respond so well to the surgery? Well that's one possibility. The other is the neuropeptides and hormones uh, and the effect that occurs further on downstream. Um, peptide YY, GLP-1, and other uh, uh, neuropeptides are uh, stimulated or not stimulated differently by the fact that food now gets to the ileum in a more solid or should I say less digested state. And uh, uh, in fact certain studies have been done where uh, feeding tubes are placed into the ileum and, f and less digested food is introduced into the ileum and there is a satiation to the animal uh, uh, so they uh, virtually want to starve to death. They feel completely full and no need to eat because of the food that's put into the ileum at a less, less digested state and there are these effects on neuropeptides and hormones uh, and it is felt that if we could somehow mimic that, perhaps we could come up with a non-surgical way of taking care of diabetes. So I know I'm running out of time, but the effects of diabetes, uh, uh, of the surgery that we perform on diabetes uh, are extensive. And so what if, and this idea is already out there, but to take a liner and anchor it here at the pylorus and have that liner coat or cover the whole duodenum.
because one of the theories is that because we bypass the duodenum with the foods that we eat, there is something there that no longer is stimulated, and so uh, that may be the reason why diabetes is cured. And so, in fact, they've done this, and there's a product that may be coming to market within the next few years where they will anchor this liner here at the pylorus, sort of coat the whole lining of the uh, duodenum so food can go through the liner, but none of the digestive enzymes get to uh, affect the food until the liner ends, which is somewhere in the early part of the jejunum. And in fact, they've had some tremendous results uh, on diabetes with just that, that alone, and that can be placed endoscopically and doesn't need to be placed surgically. The problem is the anchoring me mechanism. How do you anchor something there so it doesn't get spit out or cause erosions or ulcerations and, and some of those things. But, but again, that's one of the lines that, that people are looking at. Um, the other is, we mentioned GLP-1 uh, seems to go up uh, and, and has a dramatic effect on diabetes. Couldn't we just give a patient more GLP-1, make a synthetic GLP-1 uh, and give it to them? The problem is once it hits the bloodstream, it lasts for, uh, I think, two seconds and then it's gone. And so you'd have to constantly infuse GLP-1 to get that same uh, effect that your body creates after the surgery. But, um, you know, the conclusion is simple. It, it is very clear that this surgery is an effective treatment for type 2 diabetes. When I was a medical student and when I was a resident and early in my uh, post-residency, if a patient was diagnosed with type 2 diabetes, their family practitioner or internist said, I'm sorry, you have type 2 diabetes. Here's a bottle of pills or here's a bottle of pills with insulin. I want you to watch what you eat. I want you, you to you know, uh, do some more exercise and then hope and pray that in the next 20 years you don't lose your eyesight, your kidneys, or your legs. Now we can look at that same patient and say, you have type 2 diabetes and you're overweight. I have an operation that may cure you, again, using cure in the, its loosest sense. Uh, and not just 10% of the time or 20% of the time, because I think some people would take that shot, 20% chance of diabetes, okay, I'll do that, 85% of the time. And so, uh, again, that, uh, this procedure is very effective for, for treating two, type 2 diabetes. And with time, the more we learn about how this procedure works, the more we're able to maybe come up with something that will mimic that and obviate having to undergo surgery. Anyway, uh, uh, thank you for your time. Do we want questions now? or? Yeah, we have, we have time for, uh, we should give them that. Oh. Jamalika from GI here. Um, now, if you look at the different methodology or different techniques that you use, different surgeries for that, including the banding, uh, do you see the same effect on diabetes that's based on technique, particularly the effect on ghrelin and other mediators? No. And at what BMI you will start seeing that? Okay, so everybody, I heard, I assume, heard the question. So. Um, the fact is that, no, we don't see the same thing with the band. Um, uh, and the reason why is, uh, first of all, the companies will tell, that make the band will tell you that it, it is very efficacious and can help treat diabetes. And, and that, in effect, can be seen as true after the weight loss. So it doesn't matter whether you lose 20, 30 percent of your excess body weight from the band or from exercise or from, you know, some rigid diet. Uh, weight loss, we know, is going to help type 2 diabetes, but you have to have that weight loss. And um, with the Roux and Y, as I mentioned, there's some effect, there's something that happens before they've lost a pound. I mean, they may have gained weight in the hospital just from, you know, um, they ate their last meal the night before, and, you know, that, that sort of thing. And so they really haven't lost any significant weight at all, and yet the effects of diabetes are almost immediate. Now, the, the funny one is the vertical sleeve gastrectomy, which is essentially a purely restrictive procedure. There is no bypass component. We don't divide the small bowel. We don't touch the small bowel. It's all done by removing the lateral aspect of the stomach. And I cut my, short, my talk short, but I actually had pictures of it, uh, and now I don't. But 
um, again, purely restrictive, and, and we are seeing tremendous and, and early impact on diabetes. Uh, some people say it even rivals the Rue and Y, and it comes close, I'll tell you. It's not exactly, it's not as good, but uh, it, it is pretty darn good and much easier to do. And for those people who don't want their anatomy completely changed, where my jejunum now is moved, and you know, it, it offers an option for some of those people as well. But, but the band, uh, in answer to your question, again, you have to have the weight loss for the band to work. That you can, so at what BMI you would promote? Interestingly, using, using <laughs> they've lowered the requirement. So uh -huh. uh, again, in order to justify operating on someone, doing a bariatric procedure on someone, they have to have a BMI of 40 or above. So if someone comes to you and their BMI is 40 or above, whether or not they have a single comorbidity, they are a candidate for bariatric surgery. If their BMI is 35 or about 35 to 40, and they have high blood pressure, bad diabetes, you know, any of these significant comorbidities, then you can justify doing bariatric surgery in that population. For the band, the FDA has now approved uh, 30 and above, that 30 to 40 range. Uh, again, because we know that weight loss will help uh, these people with their comorbidities and the band is a very safe procedure. We don't really divide the stomach, we don't divide the small bowel, we don't have to make new hookups or new anastomoses. You basically just go in and put this synthetic material around the upper part of the stomach and the mortality rate is exceedingly low and uh, morbidities are, are also low and so the, there is approval now to do that on someone who, with a BMI of 30 or above uh, if they have significant comorbidities. Yes? Um, the early effects that you see um, with the row and line surgery, does that occur regardless of insulin use, or does it occur, and if it does, is it like to the same degree? So if a patient is using insulin, you mean? Right. No, uh, we will see some. Uh, oftentimes the same result in that they are off their insulin, <coughs> off their hypoglycemic medication after the Rue and Y. But an, interest, an, uh, an interesting question to follow up is what about the type 1 diabetics that only require you know, insulin? They, they, they don't uh, make any insulin, and so they, they have to give themselves insulin. Oddly enough, and for reasons that, that I certainly don't know, I don't think anybody knows, we oftentimes see an improvement after the surgery they, they almost will need a drop in the amount of insulin. And again, is it the weight loss? Well, yeah, long term, I think it is the weight loss. But we see it right away as well. And, and I don't know why that is. Because they don't make any insulin of, the, of their own. OK, as, uh, as John is transitioning, I have a question for you. OK. Um, what are the numbers of people getting diet? Well, here we do, like I say, about 400 or so a year. Nationwide, the Rue and Y, there's uh, somewhere between 150 to 180,000 of those procedures done nationwide. What's the mortality that you quote to your Rue and Y candidates? Well, we put up a slide that says that nationwide, the mortality rate for a Rue and Y is about 1%. But that nationwide number is taking all comers. So, and they wanted me to stand here. Right? Oh, yeah. Sorry about that. <laughs> Um, so that's taking all comers. So that's taking the guys who do this at a university setting and those people who do it at an outpatient s setting. Uh, guys who do it uh, have been doing it for 11 or more years like me, people who just came out of their residency or, or their fellowship and started doing it. So when you take all comers, it's about uh, 8%. If you look at our numbers uh, over the last four or five years, I mean, we have one in a thousand. I mean, we're, we're much better than that. I don't, do you know our actual number? Um, I'm not going back to this uh, earlier era. Yeah. So it's less than 0.1. Yeah, it's much less than 0.1. I don't know the actual number. Uh, it may be more than one in a thousand, but it's... No, no, no. Point zero. I thought it was zero until, the, but then there was one who, uh, yeah. You have, to, you have to quote a mortality after surgery if it happens within 30 days. It doesn't matter if somebody came and shot him in the head afterwards. And so if you use that criteria, I know of one. If you don't use that criteria, to be honest, I don't know of one. So within the last few years, yeah.
All right, I'll go ahead and get started. Um, thank you for that great talk. I want to start with a proviso. I actually trained at the university, East Carolina University, where they um, found that diabetes um, was gone within one to two days after surgery. And I worked with the physiologist biochemist who worked with Dr. Pori's. Um, and they're still getting money thrown at them to, they want to retire, but they can't because they're still getting people trying to help uh, have them figure out why diabetes goes away. The other proviso I want to give is that I totally agree if you have a BMI of over 40 and you've struggled with your weight your whole life um, and you have diabetes or another comorbidity, I, I believe in bariatric surgery. I did some studies there and it had tremendous impact on those people's lives. And I have people in my family who, who would really benefit from the surgery and have struggled with, with it their whole life. But my talk more so is on the BMI range of a, of a 28 to 35. Um, the, the typical obese person the, that we all know, not the morbidly obese person who's extremely overweight, but the typically obese person. And so I kind of try to come up with a funny title, but provocative at the same time. An underappreciated, underused, cheap pleo pleiotropic treatment for type 2 diabetes. And I'm, I'm going to make the case, uh, although I have a limited time, to say we've never really tried exercise in a medically supervised way. We've never hired the right professionals to do it. We've never made it mandatory like a 12-week cardiac rehab. So we don't really know if it'll really work or not. But let's get started on what we know. Okay, diabetes prevalence rates have, have jumped dramatically from the 1980s to 2004. Um, and they're supposed to double um, from 2000 to 2030. Shockingly, one out of three children born since 2000 will have diabetes in their lifetime. And usually, if you read the medical literature, it's genetics, diet, and body weight. But of course, here at MU, with the research group I work with, we believe it's due to an inactive lifestyle is the, bigger, is the biggest culprit. And of course, when you're talking about diabetes, you're really talking about blood glucose control. Oh, sorry. You're really talking about blood glucose control. I don't like standing behind a lectern. Um, and so what that comes down to is what happens when you consume a meal, and particularly postprandial glucose disposal. Glucose goes up, it stimulates the pancreas to produce insulin, and, and the insulin then is supposed to increase glucose uptake in the muscle, that's the primary disposal site after a meal, and it's supposed to turn off glucose production in the liver, which is in charge of maintaining euglycemia between meals, but after a meal you want to turn that off. And what happens in diabetes is that both of these tissues become resistant to the effects of insulin, so that leads to a bigger glucose response after every meal. Then you get dysfunction in the pancreas. So early on, the pancreas tries to counter this effect by producing more and more insulin, which leads to hyperinsulinemia. But then you get dysfunction in the pancreas, and the pancreas can no longer push, produce enough insulin, and then you have type 2 diabetes. There's also evidence that there's some vascular adaptations that occur too, i.e. the insulin does not increase blood flow um, to the skeletal muscle beds, so less insulin and glucose can get to the skeletal muscle beds, and you can have less glucose uptake into the muscle. So how does it progress over time? I don't really want to spend a bunch of time on this, but this is a, a study looking at glucose tolerance test or mixed meals um, showing glucose and insulin responses across lean, obese, impaired glucose tolerant, and diabetic. And you can see over time the glucose response gets worse from the control, and it takes more and more insulin to dispose of the glucose. Um, and then you get to a point where there's beta, beta cell dysfunction, and the type 2 diabetic still produces insulin but they produce it at a slower rate than they do when they're obese or impaired glucose tolerant. Okay, so that allows glucose to get really out of control. But what we do know, yes? So is that saying that they all have the same fasting insulin level? No, this is scaled in a way that you don't see that. Insulin would slope up like this. So fasting insulin is extremely elevated in, in obese and diabetic individuals. It's a good question. Um, and what we do know is that both chronic hyperglycemia, you can see this is fasting glucose in a lean, this is fasting glucose in a diabetic. We know that chronic hyperglycemia leads to cardiovascular disease. And even more so now, there's a lot of literature suggesting that it's the postprandial glucose excursions, these big shifts in glucose after a meal, that the epidemiological data suggests is even a bigger um, cause of cardiovascular disease, more tightly linked than chronic hyperglycemia. And I'll get back to the importance of that in a second. But of course, in the clinic, the most important thing we look at is HbA1c. I think everyone in here knows what that is, so I'm going to move forward after that. And we know that if we can lower HbA1c, that we lower disease risk substantially. So this is what happens if you lower HbA1c by one point in type 2 diabetics. For example, you'll lower um, my, um, myocardial infarction rates by 
microvascular disease by 25 percent. I should mention that in these studies, this is a small, hoard, a small cohort of individuals that actually have a lowering of HbA1c. If you look at all the subjects in these studies and all the drugs that have been used over time, typically people's HbA1c's get worse and worse and worse with the current standard therapy that we use right now. And in a recent Lancet review, they kind of talked about this, um, talking about management of type 2 diabetes. And I'm just going to share some of these quotes. Pharmacological compounds, however, have several limitations. Most initial improvements in glycemia are not maintained because the beta cells continue to deteriorate. Furthermore, many of these treatments have side effects, hypoglycemia, weight gain, GI disturbances, peripheral edema, um, and cardiovascular effects. New treatments need to be developed that will sustain glycemic control, reverse or halt the decline in beta cell function, assist with weight loss, improve insulin action, avoid hypoglycemia, and have a favorable effect on cardiovascular disease. I think you know where I'm going with this. Exercise does every single one of these, and it's all proven, and I'll show you some new data. You may not know some of the data going in here with, with beta cell, but hopefully I can get to it. So, from a big picture, what does chronic exercise do for HbA1c? And again, I want to give the proviso. These are studies done in BMIs of 33, 34, 35. So Bill Krause's lab at Duke did a study in a large cohort of individuals looking at um, aerobic exercise three to four times a week versus resistance exercise three to four times a week. They pick well, yeah, they, they, they pick well-controlled diabetics. That's right. Because the reason is if you get in the out of control range, they're, they're all a mishmash. You can't do a study. You're not going to get, you're going to have so much variability in your See, design. The highest mortality would be with people who have... You have high mortality with these individuals. A1C. Well, yeah. there will be, but hemoglobin sure. A1C of 9 and 10, that is sure. not controlled. Sure. But we haven't tested if we can control right. this with this exercise. And NIH wouldn't fund it because they'd say it's too variable population. So you're, you're handcuffed well, by... Maybe those are the then there's evidence of that as well. But we haven't tried it in a medically supervised way to see if we can actually get them past a fitness threshold to sustain exercise. Okay, so let's look at the results here. This is the paper, and this is just summarizing. If they used a combined aerobic plus resistance exercise modality, at six months, they went from a 7.4 to 6.5, 0.9 difference, percent change of 13%, and if you remember, that lowers the risk of heart attack by 15%, microvascular complications by 25%. This is the effects with the aerobic, and this is the effects with the resistance training alone. So these are powerful effects, and remember, in most individuals on current standard therapy, if they don't increase their physical activity levels, their glycemia just keeps getting worse. So even if we saw no change in maintenance over a six-month period, that would be a powerful effect. Um, and they have that here with control. Um, they, they went up a little bit, and you could argue that in six months isn't long enough to see it go up even more. This is a meta-analysis that was um, just recently published in JAMA, and they looked at 47 different random control trials that looked at exercise. They looked at aerobic exercise, resistance exercise, studies that had combined both modalities, um, studies where they had just told the people to be more physically active and then gave them diet modifications, and then studies where they just told them to be more physically active. And you can see the lowering here. And across the board, um, studies that used aerobic exercise were the most powerful, um, followed by physical activity and diet, and resistance training had an effect as well. And we can talk about resistance training later if you want. There's some evidence that people with diabetes would rather be doing resistance training than aerobic training. And one of the really neat things they got out of the study was, was really it was a duration effect. If individuals spent at least 150 minutes a week doing exercise, they had a much more powerful effect than if they were below 150 minutes a week of exercise. So this is big, big picture HbA1c. What goes on in the different tissues? Well, um, I will say that this was followed by an editorial saying that insurance companies should start paying for diabetes treatment with exercise, and, and I won't go into that now, so I save time. Although they did say in the paper that it would be more cost effective to let the people get diabetes first, so that's pretty controversial. Um, Exercise, how does it work to treat diabetes? So I'm gonna, what I'm going to do is quickly show you some short-term exercise and chronic exercise training studies examining what happens in muscle, what happens in vascular tissue, what happens in liver, and what happens in pancreas using lab-based techniques. I'm going to focus on short-term exercise studies, either one bout or seven days of exercise, 
because these really show what the effect of the exercise is itself and not the chronic adaptations or the weight loss that can sometimes occur. Okay, so these are powerful studies because of that. And I'm going to show you some new data from our lab using continuous glucose monitoring, which really gets more back to application and isn't so much a lab-based technique. So starting with muscle, what happens in muscle with exercise? Well, we know that one bout of, well, let me step back. We know that insulin-stimulated glucose transport is one mechanism by which you increase glucose transport through the insulin signaling pathway. A separate mechanism is through muscle contraction. Muscle contraction itself activates GLU4 translocation to the membrane and increases glucose uptake. And it's been known for several years that there's some kind of interaction between these two pathways. So that if you exercise before you're exposed to insulin, your muscle is exposed to insulin, it's much more sensitive. And we know in healthy individuals, there's an additive effect of glucose on glucose transport when these two pathways are combined. And in an insulin-resistant person, you actually get synergy. And I'll show you what I mean here in a second. So this is um, data from a healthy person. And they actually measured glucose transport across both legs. One leg was contracted for 15 minutes before it was stimulated. The other leg was rested. And you can see here, this is insulin on the bottom and glucose transport, glucose uptake on this axis. And you can see in the contracted leg here on the left, it takes much less insulin to give the same increase in glucose uptake. So that shows you how powerful one bout of exercise has on glucose transport and insulin stimulate glucose transport. And then another study followed this up in type 2 diabetics. They again looked at, um, they, they gave a hyperinsulinemic euglycemic clamp where you, hyper, you infuse a high level of insulin and then you also infuse glucose. The more glucose you have to infuse, the more insulin sensitive they are. And they did it under two conditions in individuals with diabetes. Um, here's a, almost an 8 HbA1c, Dr. Ibda. Okay, and so they, they did it one day where there was just, they just laid in the bed, and they did it another day where they exercised for 30 minutes during the clamp. And this is the raw data over here, and they plotted it two different ways in the controls and diabetics, but it's quantified over here. You can see in the control, there was an increase in glucose uptake. The diabetic was very low, and there was a significant increase in, in, the, um, in the diabetic with one bout of exercise, okay? This is a two-fold, two-and-a-half-fold increase with one bout of exercise. So there's no weight loss here. There's no other adaptations occurring. What about seven days of exercise? This is a model that's commonly used because you do um, an hour of exercise a day for seven days. It doesn't cause weight loss. It doesn't cause many of the adaptations like an improvement in cardiorespiratory fitness. It doesn't increase mitochondrial content, but it does improve insulin sensitivity. So you can see here, this is their insulin sensitivity before and after the seven days of exercise. And you also start to get an increase in GLUT4 protein content in skeletal muscle, which always correlates with better insulin sensitivity and glucose disposal. Again, only with seven days of exercise. What about, the blood, what about blood flow and vascular adaptations? In a study that uh, I collaborate with Dr. Fidel on, we recruited obese, sedentary, type 2 diabetes individuals, and we measured femoral blood flow changes during an oral glucose tolerance test before and after seven days of exercise again. So here's the, the study uh, design. Um, we measured blood flow at baseline, then they consumed a glucose beverage, and then we measured blood flow, uh, blood flow incrementally after that. And the idea was that their own insulin production, insulin is known to stimulate blood flow, increase in blood flow through ENOS. The idea was that hopefully we would see improved insulin stimulated blood flow. And that's what we saw. This is absolute blood flow in the individuals before and after seven days of exercise, this is the percent change we get after only seven days of exercise. And because these individuals already have diabetes, their insulin production didn't change in that seven-day period. So this effect occurred with the same um, insulin production. Okay, what about the liver? Okay, remember, again, the liver in a diabetic pushes out too much glucose, and after they eat a meal, they continue to push out too much glucose. The insulin that's produced does not uh, suppress hepatic glucose production. Okay, this is seven days of exercise, recently published, I think last year. Um, and this is hepatic glucose production in the basal state. It's suppressed. And hepatic glucose production um, during the clamp when, hyper, when you have hyperinsulinemia. You can see it's suppressed. So again, seven days of exercise dramatically improves hepatic glucose control. All right, finally, the holy grail, the pancreas. Okay, 
There's a lot of data coming out now that exercise can improve beta cell function. It was, uh, people did not think this could occur for a long time, but now the studies are being designed appropriately. And one of the reasons is people evaluate C-peptide production because C-peptide is released when insulin is released, and it doesn't get degraded as quickly as insulin. So in this study, oh, and so before I go on, I want to say that we know that when individuals become less insulin sensitive, they compensate by producing more insulin in their beta cells, so they can work on this, this range right here. The people who develop diabetes are the ones who can't compensate, and over time, their beta cell function goes down. So again, if we can fix this problem, then we can start moving towards really um, helping stop the progression of the disease. So in this study, this is actually a chronic exercise study with 5% weight loss. So I think it was six months with 5% weight loss. So it's exercise plus diet. And they wanted to look to see if that type of treatment could change beta cell function. This is the glucose area of the curve uh, during an oral glucose tolerance test. Oh, the other thing to put in here is that they, they looked at obese individuals with type 2 diabetes, and they also looked at obese individuals with normal glucose control. So you can see that the area under the curve for glucose was, was lowered, not down to the normal gl glucose tolerance people. Um, but C-peptide production during the OGTT was significantly increased. Okay, so it was lowered in the obese person because they're hyperinsulinemic, so they no longer have to produce as much insulin. But it was increased in the diabetic person who can't produce as much insulin before and now can. So it's a differential response depending if the person has diabetes or not. And these are just other indices of this data, basically, different ways to calculate it. This is change in C-peptide with change in glucose during that glucose tolerance test. You can see, again, there's evidence of increased beta cell function. Again, these are people with a BMI of around 33 going into the trial, not a BMI of 40. Um, what they did find in this study is increased production of GIP, which is an incretin produced by the gut, which increases in concentration when you eat a meal and is meant to go to the pancreas and stimulate beta cell function and improve insulin release. And they think this is where they're getting their beta cell improvement because if they correlate um, the insulin secretion with the change in GIP or the change in insulin secretion with the change in GIP, they see a significant correlation. So the holy grail exercise does improve beta cell function. Finally, in getting to some studies that we've been working on, um, we started working with the continuous glucose monitors. I saw Rebecca Palmer in the audience. She was really um, helpful in getting us this going in our lab. And what these do is they measure glucose every minute of the day, and the individual can leave the lab, and we can assess their glucose concentrations throughout the day. And we can assess their glucose before and after every meal, so we can get an idea of how much their glucose swings up in the postprandial condition, which I said is a, is a big cardiovascular risk factor. And we call that the amplitude of glycemic excursions. So we did another seven-day exercise study. And before they started the exercise, we outfitted them with CGMS. Um, and they got their normal habitual physical activity, which was extremely low, very sedentary individuals, only getting 4,500 steps a day. And they ate controlled meals. And the fourth morning, we did the oral glucose tolerance test. We had a washout. Then we started seven days of exercise training. And again, at those last three days of exercise training, we outfitted them with the probes, and they ate the exact same meals that they were eating during this three-day period. Only now, because of the one hour of exercise per day in our lab, they were now getting eight to 10,000 steps a day. So they got the same activity, but we doubled it with the one hour of exercise. And I think they rather enjoyed coming in and exercising in the lab, despite what people think. Okay, so again, we can quantify glucose excursions what their glucose was before the meal and what it was after the meal. And what we did was there was nine meals during the three-day period. We averaged the response to all those nine meals. And you get what we have here, the mean amplitude of glycemic excursion, or the amount that glucose swung up from pre-meal to post-meal. You can see it was significantly lowered at 30, 60, 90, 120, and 150 minutes after the meals consumed, after only seven days of exercise. And again, if the epidemiological data is correct, that this is the best predictor of, early, of cardiovascular disease, we think this is a, a, a significant finding, a powerful finding. The other great thing we saw was that we basically sh saw evidence that the whole glucose range during the day, the swings, were all tightened down. One of the big problems that you see with aggressive drug, ther drug therapy for um, lowering HPA1C is that you see a lot of hypoglycemia. 
we actually saw an improvement, less hypoglycemia. The duration below a certain low limit was lowered. The duration above a certain high limit was lowered. Um, the minimum blood glucose did not change, but the maximum blood glucose was lowered during the day. And the change between those values was, went from 10 to 6.9. So with this device, we can actually look at what their glucose is throughout the day and quantify how tight their glucose control is. Much better than HbA1c, which is a, an estimate over a two to three month period. And a lot of data now suggests it doesn't really adequately reflect what happens during postprandial periods. So this is a quote from Dr. Bill Krauss at Duke. And he says, to envision the importance of exercise and imagine an inexpensive pill that could decrease the hemoglobin A1c value by one percentage point, reduce cardiovascular disease, and substantially improve functional capacity, strength, endurance, and bone density. Diabetes experts would be quick to incorporate this pill into practice guidelines and performance measures for diabetes. And he would know. He sees, well, he's a cardiologist, actually, so he sees the, the outcomes of it all. So again, to recap, we see lower HbA1c. We see lower glycemic variability, and it's because we have improved function at all three of these levels and an improved function in the vascular uh, level as well. Finally, for discussion, I'd like to bring up a, a few points. Um, I always hear the word exercise. People won't do it, and I completely reject that hypothesis. If, you, if I have diabetes and you tell me I should exercise, and you don't tell me why I should exercise and the mechanisms and show me how powerful this is, yeah, I may not do it. But if you really show, show me and explain to me how powerful it is, I think that those people would, would take it into account, um, especially the people that care about their health. But implementation is the key. I think that's the key, and we can talk about that. Um, obviously, you have thousands of other benefits to exercise, and I won't go over them here. Um, and again, I wanted to bring up the bariatric surgery angle again. I have some slides that have, have done similar studies to what I showed here after bariatric surgery, and we can look at those if someone wants to bring them up. Um, but I, I do want to do it for, um, put it in my talk because of time. So we'll take questions. Yes. All right, Dr. Delatore said with gastric bypass, 85% of resolution of type 2 diabetes. Mm -hmm. The problem is less than 1% of people that are potential candidates for surgery actually get the surgery usually because of problems getting insurance coverage and so on and so forth. What percent of patients with type 2 diabetes do you think will be long term compliant with that? They, they could be. But right now, all I'm saying right now is there's no insurance reimbursement to get exercise counseling from an exercise physiologist. Um, diabetes educators, I think, do a great job, but they don't have the training in exercise physiology to adequately prescribe, most of them, um, exercise. And I think also you could try to figure out what type of activities a person likes because we all have different activities we like or dislike, and so you just give that standard, you need to do 50 minutes a day, that may not work, and so it needs to go further. I don't know how to answer your question about how many, it's, it's, it is low, but again, if you try to get all conditions in the best possible way, so that the outcomes are the, you know, you get your highest outcomes, that needs to be tested, and I don't think that's been done. Yes? Uh, in the diabetes world, we um, learn to, set our objectives a little bit lower, and mm -hmm. so in some patients, we encourage them to just be active. Mm -hmm. And how does that uh, stack up against an hour of exercise a day is a lot. And so it is. We sometimes, very often, go to that, just be more active. Don't sit in front of the TV, walk. Yeah. So how can we encourage our patients to do that and make it that makes a difference? That's a great question. There's people trying to do research on how can you get to be more active. And a lot of people now are saying, cut down your sedentary time. Don't sit as much. Break, break up your sedentary time. Um, try to have some activities during the day where you're up on your feet moving around. Um, and I'm not a behaviorist, but I know there are people working on that. But I think that's a good point. So this is the data on, on physical activity when they're just told to be more physically active. It is quite a bit lower than a, you know, a medically supervised exercise regime. So I'm almost wondering if it's like cardiac rehab, you do 12 weeks of monitored exercise in the hospital, 
with diabetes care, or diabetes educators, nurses, physicians, and an exercise physiologist all as a part of, a part of the team, then fitness gets improved, then they, it's less of a burden for them to get up and move, they're gonna feel better, and it's gonna be easier for them to then take on and have a more physically active lifestyle. But I agree, both exercise and improving physical activity in their daily life, both should be um, areas that we, we push. Great question. There's good information in pediatric literature that if we can have children not six hours a day in front of the television mm -hmm. or the computer, that we can make a huge impact. And besides cutting out their physical education uh, uh, time in school, but I would comment that uh, you have shown this data in a, a smaller group of patients, not mm -hmm. smaller, but a, the BMI is, is less, it's in the obesity range. Right. Uh, it's very tempting to think that obesity is a, just continues on upward and becomes severe obesity and more severe obesity, and ignoring the genetic factors that are there. I would pose the question that if you have somebody who's 500 pounds and they walk around and get around, uh, their exercise just to breathe yeah. and to move around has caused them to have significantly higher muscle mass, and they lose a lot of energy doing mm -hmm. that. I don't know whether that will conflict with your opinion. Well, they, there's evidence that as the BMI goes up, the physical activity during the day goes down substantially, and it's correlated very tightly. So they wouldn't be getting much activity. I, I know what you're saying, though. They do have more muscle mass, and another positive adaptation is better bone density. Those are about the two things that they have going for them. But so, it, what's the, did I answer your question? I, I don't think that's a good answer. Okay. <laughs> there has been there has been seven and ten day exercise studies in extremely obese individuals, and they they tolerate it. Um, it's at a much lower intent. They they exercise at a much lower movement um, to get to their heart rate because they're so out of shape. But. But John, one, one thing about this symposium and both of you, uh, I think that's one of the things about bariatric surgery. You, you give these people the capacity to then do activity yes. and exercise. And I haven't heard any of you discuss that aspect because when we study some of these patients who are about the same, they're 500 pounds. It's they hard to exercise. Yeah. They're, they're very active just because everything's a huge effort. But then they get the surgery, their life has changed, and they're, now, they're active now. Mm -hmm. And so I think it's kind of both of them come together. I bet they're doing a lot more exercise after. Yeah, and if you, if you look like at this, I'll go to one of those studies, they're still, they actually, the, the most recent data I've seen is after surgery, they still have impaired glucose tolerance. Um, so uh, yeah, their mortality rates and their diabetes is gone, but um, if you look here, they need to exercise. Um, their two hour glucose one year after surgery is still close to 150, which is close to impaired glucose tolerance. So I would suggest that they need to exercise after the surgery. And in fact, when I was at ECU, most of the, um, we were trying to recruit sedentary post gastric bypass women and we couldn't find them. They mostly had changed their life and become much more active and had better diets. So it was hard to find the controls who were inactive. Yeah. yeah. Yeah, to actually implement them. The yeah. And I don't know exactly why that is. Um, insurance companies, I would think. Yeah, yeah. And so United Healthcare, I read about it in the New York Times about two years ago. They've implemented a major prevention program and diabetes treatment program run through YMCAs. And it's an active prevention and treatment with diet and exercise, but it's only in big urban areas where they have YMCAs. But I think there are insurance companies starting to get this. Um, the problem is they have to be insured by the same person throughout their whole life for the insurance company to get benefit, right? I, I lost my mic, but I, but I hope I can still be, still be heard. The other um, thing, the other um, uh, thing that I think really underscores your work is that this actually has been done on a large population basis. 
Yeah, yeah exactly. Now yeah. People and that was prevention. Mm -hmm. Duplicated in the international setting in, in China and Finland. Finland yep. It shows that if you take at risk persons for type 2 diabetes and employ an, a, an exercise program, that you can reduce the incidence of type 2 diabetes by up to 60% yep. over a period of as short as six years. Um, the, the lesson of the DTC, though, is that it really does require a great deal of professional supervision mm -hmm. to prevent recidivism right. in, in those programs. Yep. So it's, it's, you know, it's not a it's not a give a prescription for exercise and, and then walk away. I totally agree.